Good morning. Okay. Good morning, 476. Great to see you here this morning. Hope you had a safe drive in. Let's stand together. 476. I have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. 476 on the first. I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free as free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. I have found the pleasure I once craved. What a wondrous blessing I am saved from the awful gulf of sin. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been. Hey, y'all don't look like you want to sing. You look like you want to talk. So why don't we take this time, go around and greet one another this morning. Say hey. <laughs> All right, make your way back to your seats. That's enough talking, amen. <laughs> uh, we wouldn't have to do that if you guys would just treat each other bad. So, you know, since you love each other, we got to take this time to do that. You can be seated, 476. Let's sing the last verse, then we'll let our pastor come up here. I have found the joy no tongue can tell how its waves of glory roam. It is like a great or flowing well springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, oh, the half has never yet been told. All right, I just had to take a moment and share this with you. Uh, if you guys, you've been in church, so you haven't heard the news, but there was an earth-shattering event that happened in Japan on the island of Okinawa, and um, I was able to get a picture of it, so I thought, man, I need to share that with you guys. And so, uh, is it Sound Booth or what, Sound Booth? Yeah, Sound Booth too. So tell me when it comes up there. Is it up there yet? All right. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? They are 14 hours ahead of us. Sure, man. That's great, man. Absolutely. 
And uh, that is uh, our very own Cade did the whole thing. Now, I'm not sure if she says, I swear with my right hand. <laughs> I'm not sure. Or she was getting ready to slap him. I'm not sure what that was all about. But how sweet is that, huh? And, uh, and her name there, Dad, is he in here? Ritzman's in here? All of them. Do you know her name, guys? Ooh, man, how you spell it? You have any idea? Fatima? Fatima? Okay, okay. And uh, well, that's it. So that's a done deal now. So uh, I'm assuming she said yes. I didn't get the rest of the story. But, uh, but I just wanted to make sure and share that with you. How sweet. It's been a blessing that, how, what the Lord has done in that young fellow's life. And uh, we were just talking about it. He's a little spunky for a while. And then uh, well, he's in the military. And then God got a hold of his heart. And he bought a van. He's taking troops back and forth to church. He preached on New Year's Eve. I think it was New Year's Eve. And uh, it's just a blessing to watch what God's doing with that young fella. Uh, so I thought I'd share that with you. Why don't you come up and do some announcements? Would you, Douglas? Thank you. All right, ushers, you can come forward. If you need a giving envelope or a bulletin, please uh, raise your hand. <clears throat> All right, we're going to have a maintenance day here at the church. Uh, we don't have it set on the calendar yet, but if you are a handy man and you know what you're doing, or if you just want to do some grunt work like I am going to be and like some others of us will do who don't know what we're doing, um, but if you want to help out, please see Brother Keek over, and uh, he is going to put a list of things together and put guys on different jobs, and there's a lot that needs to be done. Doors that need to be changed and cut, counters that need to be put in, lots of things. So we're going to have that coming up. Please make sure to see Brother Keek over if you want to help out with that. Can you raise your hand, Brother? There he is. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, we've got uh, Evangelist Herb Hutchinson coming on February 8th, and he was at Temple Baptist Church in Kalamazoo for 32 years. Now he's in evangelism, and uh, so we're, gonna, we're honored to have him with us all day. Our Valentine's Banquet is coming up February 26th at 6 p.m. And we've got more people signing up. Please make sure you do that. It's on the uh, stand back there by the media booth. $15 a person and uh, single adults through Senior Saints. And uh, see me if you have any questions about it. But it'll be here at the church February 26th. We still need to work out the nursery details, but... Um, please make sure to sign up for that if you haven't already. If you need your 2020 giving statement and you haven't gotten it yet, please, uh, well, I guess if you need it, that means you haven't gotten it yet. So make sure you come see me, please. And uh, I have that for you. And, and then we've got our newest members in the bulletin here, the Cochran family and the Meyer family. And uh, we'll be putting some other ones in there next week. And their addresses are there if you want to egg their house or... Uh, TP or whatever works best for you, it's all right there. So um, we've got, let's see, Brother Robert, we need somebody to fill in for treasury duty this morning. One of you men that could do that. Thanks, brother. All right, you can come forward, gentlemen. Nursery workers, just a reminder, this morning in the uh, infant nursery, it's Christina and Dovey. Uh, the infant nursery tonight is Miss Sue and Bella. The toddler nursery tonight is Pong and Lily. So please make sure you're doing that. And if you want to help out in the nursery, we will try to fit you in. Not many opportunities there, but we'll try to make that happen. All right, anything else that needs to be announced? Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, the Martins need some tissue boxes or shoe boxes, empty ones, if you could bring those uh, here to the church. They need that for a Valentine's, Valentine's project that they're working on. So... All right, anything else? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you that we can be here this morning. Please work in our hearts and bless our offering. In Jesus' name, amen.
you can remain seated, 69, page number 69. Thanks for coming this morning. Page number 69. How I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Empty that thou shouldest fill me, a clean vessel in thy hand, with no power but as thou givest graciously. With each command, channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Witnessing thy power to save me, setting free from self and sin, Thou who bought us to possess me in thy fullness, Lord, come in. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Jesus, fill now with thy spirit, hearts that full surrender know that the streams of living water from our inner man may flow. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us, thou canst use us every day. Find the book of Amos. You might want to look at your index and find a page number. Or if you find Matthew, you go back about an eighth of an inch of pages and you'll find Amos, one of the minor prophets. Let's say welcome. Is it Anthony Brown? Is that right? Do I have that right? Anthony, right there. Good to have you, my friend. From Nunica. All right. Uh, what brings you down this way? Hi, her. How are you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. I had a friend of mine, he, he preached at a Bible church up in Nunica years ago, and uh, uh, named Dave Porter was his name. I remember him being up there for a while. Good to have you with us. Appreciate it. You weren't a military guy, were you? You have that look like you were. That's why. Okay. Good to have you, Anthony. I appreciate you coming, buddy. Listen, it is the season for sickness. So if you get if you start feeling puny, don't come to church, man. I mean, we don't need the government to tell us that, right? We're smart enough to figure that out on our own. Like we're gonna listen to anything they have to say anyway, and because uh, they ain't, I don't know what they're doing. So, uh, but if you're not feeling, we got some folks out this morning that the kids just weren't feeling well. That's exactly the right decision. Keep them home. You know, it's better to give than receive, unless it comes to sickness. Then you just keep that to yourself, and uh, that'd be good. And uh, I'm telling you, I was talking to Ryan up here. I wish, of course, the computer broke down Wednesday. That's why we couldn't record the services and all. But I'm telling you, that Wednesday night service helped me so much. I went out of here Wednesday night so encouraged and helped. And I, I've, I've uh, rode along on that since uh, Wednesday night. And the Lord is so gracious to us. And those of you who were there understand what I'm talking about. That just the blessing of it, man. It was just needed in the midst of everything else that was going on. Uh, this past week. So, everybody find it? I'll give you plenty of time. Amos 7. Amos chapter 7 is where we're going to be. Amos chapter 7. We're going to begin reading in verse number 10, and we'll read through the end of that chapter. I'll read the first 
and you the second, and pay real close attention to what's going on. Amos is the prophet of the Lord in an ungodly culture. Again, I'll read the second, or first you read the second, and we'll end up together on the 17th. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more in Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. Then answered Amos, and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore, hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not in Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of this land. Father, I ask for your help now, and as I seek to open the word of God, to preach to the folks, to encourage them in a very almost a discouraging proclamation, uh, certainly a dark proclamation by the man of God. And yet there in here are some truths that will help us immensely, I think, Father, in this particular time and era of our nation. Father, we would learn as followers of you how to conduct ourselves properly, proclaiming your word uncompromisingly. Father, I need your help this morning. I pray for the singing as it comes forth, the special music that would come from humble hearts, and it would be presented as a sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you before your holy throne. Bless the service today, Father. Please do so. And those of our church who are not well, God, bring healing to them speedily. Those who are traveling, we've got... Several traveling, several more will be here soon, and Lord, you would watch over them. Thank you for our visitors being here. Thank you for Tim and Dre being able to be here with us, and for Anthony being able to be here. And Lord, I ask you to watch care over them and, and help us today as we fellowship together around your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. shore they faced the storm and suddenly they feared for their lives but upon the sea there someone walked on the water as they listened for his cry that's when they heard him call out their name and suddenly he said it is I shine and my ship is tossed and torn he 
could find them in the middle of their sea. But with little faith and God's good grace, joy would overcome their disbelief. Now there are times in life when I face the storm and I wonder if I ever will survive. That's when I hear him call out my name, and tenderly he says, It is I. He's the eye of the storm, the center of my calm, the place where I find shelter, the place where I find warmth, the center of my ways, the keeper of my day. Feel the sunshine, and my ship is tossed and torn. He's the eye of the storm. And do not fear when he is near. Take hold of his strong hand. Listen closely to his words. He's the great I am. The great I am. Remember this, the great I am still is, the eye of the storm, the center of my calm, the place where I find shelter, the place where I find warmth, the center of my ways, the keeper of my days, when I can't feel the sunshine. My ship is tossed and torn, he's the eye of the storm, he's the eye of the storm, the great I Pray for that dear family. If you noticed a slight resemblance to one of our new members, that was Abby Keekover's baby sister, older sister. She's much older than you, isn't she? Okay. That's your older sister? Okay. All right. God bless you. I understood you girls have sung together a couple of times too, so we'll, we may have to Bring that one to be also. Lord, uh, I love it. I love those kids. That's a good young couple. And they're blessed. What they love for the Lord. All right. Here we go. It's the next installment. Um, In the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Thank you again, guys, for that song. Outstanding job. Great message. And... Uh, needed that in the eyes and they're singing the eye of the storm and I'm preaching on the eyes habit so I guess that works together and uh, but uh, in this installment we find here in the seventh chapter of Amos the experience of Amos of nearly 3,000 years ago provides us with a modern application of an ancient truth. What has happened 3,000 years ago is as relevant as if it were written today. There's a reason behind that. Because the Word of God is an eternal document, meaning that it is always present. If it's eternal, it can never be old. It just always is. That's why when God went to that song, He said, The great I am... 
That means he always is present. God's not growing old. He ain't sick, dead, or dying. And he hasn't got the least bit concerned about catching COVID. Amen. He's doing just fine where he is. And he listen, when God answers our prayer, he doesn't tell, necessarily tell us how he's going to answer it. That he's got different ways of working things around, but he'll always do that which is right. And therefore, we as his children, when people say, well, what are we going to do? Well, whatever we're going to do, we're going to do the right thing. Because we're children of God and we want to do the right thing. So reading through chapter 7 caused this truth to burst upon the scene of my heart. And I want to share it with you tonight and tonight. I think I'm going to make it a two-part message, which you'll be glad about because it's about 10 pages long. So, uh... You'll be really glad, and even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, you're probably thinking. The book of Amos, just by virtue of introductory thought, the book of Amos is grouped with 11 others to complete the final section of the Old Testament canon of Scripture. These final 12 books are often referred to as minor prophets. Now, the moniker comes from the widely accepted division of the 39 books of the Old Testament. And here they are. You can say these numbers with me. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. All righty? 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. One more time. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. That's the division of the 39 books of the Old Testament. The first five are called the books of Moses. They're also called the Pentateuch. What's unique about the book of Moses, the books of Moses, is that Moses recorded his own death. Moses knew where he was going to die, and he knew when he was going to die, and he wrote it down. Someone had, had uh, jestingly said, I wish I knew where I was going to die, because I'd never go there. And uh, However, Moses knew exactly where he was going to die. He wrote about it, recorded it, and then went there. The next 12 books, 512, 5512, are historical books about the nation of Israel. The next five are poetical books, 512, 5, 5. The next five are major prophets, and the final 12 are minor prophets. Now, Amos is one of the minor prophets, but don't let that title dissuade you or influence you to think it's of less value. The only reason they gave that the title Minor Prophets was because of their size. They're smaller books. On average, they're smaller books. So they call them the Minor Prophets. But the content remains the same. Never forget this. All Scripture, Major Prophets and Minor Prophets, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so God says, God never changes. Everything he says is on an equal plane of authority. We're told and by Peter, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So therefore, though Amos may be a minor prophet, it's not minor in content nor authority. Now, in this wonderful yet awful Short, and I don't mean awful as bad, I mean awful, brings awe to you. Nine chapters, there are many practical truths that we can use to guide our life. And that's why we read the Bible, right? To find truths that will guide our life. A few of them that are oft repeated from this book, Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together? Except they be agreed. That's, that's a rhetorical question, but you can't walk. And so, G, so God says, listen, I'm not going to walk with Israel if Israel doesn't walk with me. Right? Now, girls, hey, honey, when you come back in, if you could sit in the back, because we have some chairs for them in the back there, that'd be good. And uh, we're going to start doing that. That way, you know, if people get up from the front and have to go out, they can come back and sit in the, in the back wall, and they don't have to, to uh, feel like they're being stared at by everybody. But, uh, so can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos chapter 4. I remember seeing this on the license or the, the bumper of a car in West Germany back in 1985. 
and I had no idea where it's come from. I was a brand new Christian. But it says, therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. That would be a great motto for our country right now, wouldn't it? Prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. When one of the first things our national government does is want to codify the murder of millions of more babies. Prepare to meet thy God. They're happy about it. They clap about it. Andrew Cuomo signed that murder of babies in New York, and they all applauded him standing around, protecting women's rights to murder their child. Prepare to meet thy God. And I know we may have, ladies, I got uh, folk, dear folks I know that have had abortions, and that's a terrible, horrible thing. And had they had another option, had they known what they know now, they would never have done that. But we ought not make it a law, and since it is a law, we need to repeal it. And uh, somebody's got to stand up for those children. By the way, I wondered about that. If we're created in the image of God, <coughs> and a liberal Christian believes that, but a liberal Christian believes in murdering babies, then at what point are we created in the image of God? Is, it just, is there some mystical, magical thing at the moment you come out of the birth canal that, poof, now you're in the image of God? I don't think so. Jeremiah said, before I was even formed, the psalmist said, before I was formed, you knew me before then. I'm not preaching on that, but it needs to be preached on a lot and often and uncompromisingly and unapologetically. Mm -hmm. So, we do not know, though, here, in the, in the, oh, let me give you another one. Amos 8, 11 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And that's what's going on in our nation also. That we can, put, we can tolerate anything but Christianity and the Word of God. Amos is a book of judgment. On a day when Amos was in the field with his sheep, God reached his heart. We have no idea the meditations of Amos's heart, but we know they must have been deeply turned to God. That was a special day in the life of Amos, and he would be forever changed as a result. And I would say any time that God gets hold of your heart, you are changed forever. Those of you who are here today that know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, at one point in your life, God got hold of your heart, and you were changed forever. From the moment that you surrendered to the truth that you were a guilty, condemned, hopeless sinner, the enemy of God without hope in this world, the moment you came to the truth that Jesus was your only hope, you were changed forever. I know, been there, done that. I know exactly what happens when a person gets saved. By the way, it is great to have Isaac back in church. Hallelujah. And Isaac, you help me out, man. I don't plan on you being there and being quiet, all right? You never have been in the past, and why start now, man? In 1-1, one, one, chapter 1, of verse 1 of Amos, and 7-14, we're informed as to what happened that day. The words of Amos, chapter 1, of verse 1, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa when he saw concerning, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah? I underlined and highlighted that word saw. And I'll show you why here in just a second. In chapter 7 and verse 14, which we read, then answered Amon and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet. Neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people. 
The key to understanding the great impact of Amos' time as a prophet is found in the little word saw of verse 1, chapter 1. This word holds the idea that it's not a visible viewing with the physical eye, but of having a message so imprinted on your heart and mind that it's akin to saying that we would say today, I can see that's not going to work out. Now, it hasn't happened yet, but you can see it in your heart. You can see it's not going to work out good. It's kind of like what's the famous last words of a redneck, right? Hey, y'all, watch this. You know, you can see it's not going to work out well. You have to forgive me. My wife and I have been binge watching Duck Dynasty, so no. I had never watched it before. That's funny, man. Those people are funny. Yeah. Mm. It does not flavor my message, by the way. I shouldn't have told you that because now you're thinking he's been watching Duck Dynasty. I think about Brahm every time I watch Duck Dynasty. <laughs> it means to see something that's not physically present. And this is crucial to the power his message had on his audience. Consider this. In chapter 1, a phrase occurs eight times. In chapter 2, that same phrase, six times. Chapter 3, seven times. Chapter 4, nine times. Chapter 5, five times. Chapter 6, four times. Chapter 7, ten times. Chapter 8, nine times. And chapter 9, seven times. Totaling 65 times. Why are those numbers significant? They represent the number of times Amos used this phrase or derivative of it. Thus saith the Lord. That means just a little over every two verses, of 100, I guess 141 verses, 65 times, just a little over every two verses, he is repeating the truth, thus saith the Lord. He wasn't looking to build up some empire or develop some TV evangelism ministry. He was simply all encompassed with what does God have to say about the condition of our nation. And that's what he did. Amos is reminding the nation of the origin of his message. So how does that help us today? Because today people need to hear, thus saith the Lord. We don't need psychoanalytical babble from pulpits across America, we need some unvarnished, old-fashioned, uncompromised, not backing up, not going out of the way, preaching of the holiness of God. God still has the answer for our nation, and our nation is not beyond His reach if we'll get back to simply preaching the Word of God without compromise. That's what we've got to get back to, friend. This whole idea of I'm okay, you're okay, has got to go by the wayside. Because neither one of us were two dead flies. Yeah. Amos was a sheep herder, a farmer. And he never lost sight of that. And I think that's why God could use him. Because he never forgot where he came from. When confronted by the well-educated and nationally renowned priest named Amaziah, Amos did not try to impress Amaziah with his credentials, but merely rehearsed his calling. I haven't been to school like you have, Amaziah. I don't have all the earmarkings of education that you have. Listen, I was just a sheep herder and still am. But God called me. God called me, and here's the message God is delivering through me. We'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Today, we need to hear from God's men what God has to say. We cannot be silenced. We cannot be intimidated. Whether it's Black Lives Matter or Antifa or the cancel culture, we cannot allow ourselves to be silenced when we have a message from Almighty God. But that boldness is only going to come when we submit ourselves to the authority of the Holy Spirit of God in our life. And when we do that and we have the authority of God's Word, never back up, never turn aside, and never compromise your job. You have a responsibility. 
God calls men to lead and bring his message to the world, and therefore God needs godly men. God needs godly men. Not like the secretary or assistant secretary of health. All right? Elko's not in here. And you would have to know that I wasn't born saved like some people. So Elko sends me this, a picture of that dear soul and makes a remark, something about a guy named D. Snyder. Yeah, there's some, there's some godly people in here. I knew there was. It's me and you, Brian. We're the only ones ungodly enough to know who I just said. But is that not true? It is. I said, you want to talk about one twisted mystery? You got that one, buddy. Yeah. And that dear person needs Christ. He doesn't need to be elevated and confirmed in this confusion. He just needs the Lord. The Lord will straighten him all out. And our job is to get the gospel to those that have need. It's difficult to imagine the impact of an army of Holy Spirit-empowered men that could have on our nation and on our world. You wonder about it. I do not believe, and I'm getting ready to start a series on the Revelation on, on uh, Sunday nights, I believe. Maybe, no, Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights it's going to be. And I'm putting it together right now. But you wonder what God could do with an army of Holy Spirit-powered witnesses. You can read about it in the Revelation. When 144,000 Jewish virgin men are going to be unleashed on a world in the midst of a seven-year tribulation period, and those 144,000 are going to be distributed between, uh, amongst 194 nations in our planet. That's about 740-some for each country. Of course, some are pretty dinky, so there'll be a bunch more in America, for instance. In China, there'll be a bunch of them. And they're going to go out, and every single person in the planet is going to hear the gospel. Yesterday, I was listening to a thing called The Amazing Israel. It was on Moody Radio. And I uh, wasn't intending on listening to it. I was intending on listening to... to uh, one of the lamplighter books I had, but I, I left my phone in my office. and So that comes up on the radio. And they were talking about last, or in 2019, there was a flash flood. And they, that uh, 25 young people were hiking in the mountain regions up by Tabor. And the flash flood came and killed 10 of them. And the reason that many died, they couldn't get signal. And so Israel developed, they're amazing, they developed a solar-powered hotspot that they already have, have distributed 30 of them throughout the mountain regions, got another 300 and some going to put in, and then they're sending them around the world so that nowhere in the world will you ever be without an Internet signal. Now, I would take you again to Revelation. I don't need to be preaching this now, but it seems to work. And he says when the Antichrist is assassinated, the whole world will see him rise up. Well, how is that going to happen? Well, now, isn't it interesting? God's using his people to make that available to the whole world. God has a responsibility for you and I, which is the crux of the message. I noticed something interesting, again, during my outside reading this week. I've been studying our nation's history with regard to our elections, and I found that in 1798, in preparation for the election, President John Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Act. It was in, its intent was to silence opposing voices or dissenting opinions from being promoted in the nation. Twenty-five Republican newspaper editors, that's not today's Republican, this is, this is before Lincoln, 25 Republican newspaper editors were prosecuted under this law. Had it continued, it would have been the death knell to our new nation. Why would one opinion want to silence the opposing viewpoint? This fits right here with Amos. 
We're facing at the very same action right now. Words are being spoken that promote the silencing of dissenting voices from the Marxist philosophy that is permeating our culture. From the public education system through the political leadership of our nation, we are being indoctrinated to replace God with the state. We can't allow that to happen. We have to rise up and let our voice be heard. But you see, it's not a new thing to silence opposing points of view. This is not something new. When they want to reprogram you, that's not something new. It's been done throughout the years, the ages. And there's a reason behind it, and I'll get to that in a moment. In our text, we have introduced, we have been introduced to a simple country boy that was a rancher and a farmer. God chose him to be the messenger of judgment and warning to a nation that turned its back on their creator. That tells me that God can use any one of you. You don't have to be some special Bible-trained scholar. You don't have to have all sorts of degrees behind your name. All you have to have is a heart that's submissive and available for God to use. That you want to be a vessel, meet for the master's use. And he will use you. In our text, we have again have been introduced to just a simple fella that would set a nation on its ear. As he preached the coming judgment of God, the word began to spread and more and more people gave ear to his message. Soon his influence made it to the nation's chief priest, Amaziah. Now you would have to know that religiously speaking, they were also political authorities. Amaziah, though he was called a priest, was not a priest of the Most High God, but a priest of the calf worship set up by King Jeroboam I. He certainly did not care for the message Amos was bringing, but for some reason, he couldn't stop it. Think about that. Let that hang there for a second. They may not agree with the message, and certainly they don't, but for some reason, they just can't stop it. They just can't stop it. Every one of us have a Bible today. But you know how hard the Roman Catholic Church worked to destroy all the Bibles? So that you would not have one, but just couldn't stop it. Every one of us have a Bible today. But now, I, 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 who was the great? Voltaire, wasn't it? The great infidel of the 19th century? that said, in my lifetime, I will erase Bibles from the planet. And then after he died, they used his house to print Bibles. Only God could do that, you know. They didn't care for the message, but he couldn't stop it. Amaziah was simply outclassed by the message of a farm boy and thus became frustrated so he ran to the king and told on the preacher. And that brings us to the two observations I'm going to give you this morning. The following observations are a window to what a devoted, honest, and burdened witness for Christ can expect in the current climate of our nation. I bring these truths to light today to prepare us to overcome the threat of discouragement in the days that lie ahead. I'm not a doomsdayer. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. I think every day is a wonderful opportunity to glorify the Lord. It's a day he's made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. But when God answers prayer, sometimes you've got to go through the deep valley to get to the answer. I don't want you to get discouraged. Or to fall into despair at the degradation of our culture. Because God would deliver a nation if there was simply a remnant that were willing to stand for him. And my challenge is to, to you is that enlist to be part of the remnant. Don't let it be enough that you're a Christian. 
Let your goal to become a disciple. One who will go out with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And sure, you do not despair, but continue to proclaim, Thus saith the Lord, and the Holy Spirit will provide the courage you need to call a nation to repentance. Let me show you in two short thoughts what you can expect as you begin to witness for Christ to a world searching for an answer to the chaos. And it is chaos. Make no mistake about it. It is chaos. Look in chapter 7, verse number 10. In fact, I don't know how many used to hear, but let's go back and look at 9. This is the last thing said before the events of 10 to 17 happen. Amos's last prophecy, he says, And in the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, Isaac, Israel, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. The sanctuaries, the worship, what they were using for worship places. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. In verse number 10, then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee. Now, Amos hadn't conspired against Jeroboam. He conspired against ungodly leadership no matter who it was. He conspired against the flow of wickedness that had taken hold of their country. Back when Jeroboam the first had established calf worship. And people gravitated to that. Say, we're done with this holiness of God and uh, living by these commandments that he's given. We're done with that. We can, we can rule ourselves. Nothing new. It's over 100 years earlier they did it in the judges, didn't they? Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It's called moral relativism. If it's not wrong to me, then it's not wrong. Amos hath conspired against thee, verse 10. In the midst of the house of Israel, the land is not able to bear all his words. How many times have you heard, the American people want to know, or the American people don't believe. And I'm thinking, dude, I'm an American people, and you ain't speaking for me. But they take the message and corrupt it, to influence people and make people who cannot critically think but sit with their oatmeal watching CNN all day and they say, that's what America is. That's not what America is. Turn your TV off, open your Bible. That'll help out. The leader of the ungodly conduct of society was what he was looking at, the leadership of it. Verse number 11, for thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. But what he did, he twisted the message. And that's what I want to warn you of. Your message will be corrupted by those who are convicted by it. The people are sending away the patience of a long-suffering God. God has been long-suffering with our nation too. But you can sin away that day of grace. You can go past God's limit of long-suffering. Amos' message was a warning to turn before it was too late. The leader of the ungodly conduct of society turned the message just enough to present it as a personal threat to the king. His message is corrupted so that it does not accomplish its goal. That's the strategy of Satan from the beginning of time. So when you go out to give the gospel and your message is twisted and they turn it on you and try to use it against you to assault you, don't be discouraged by that. That's been the ruse, the tool of Satan from the very beginning of historical time. Remember what? Satan said in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, Yea, had God said that you shall not eat of every tree? Did God really say that? You see, they start twisting it. Enough truth to capture the thought, but start twisting it. 
to use it against you. Beloved, don't be overtaken or surprised when our best intended and compassionate call to others to repent of their sinful conduct and turn to Christ is rejected, corrupted, and used against you. We saw it not more than a month ago in our own church. When the entire nation grabbed hold of a half-truth and used it to attack us. A half-truth. By the way, I watched Duck Dynasty last night. Did I tell you that? And the, the dad guy, wears the sunglasses? He says, they had, the, the old guy had sickness. And he says, I don't know about you guys. I think you ought to just get it and get over it. I'm in good company. I'm thinking about growing my beard out just a little bit more now. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, man, you're going to get in trouble saying that, old man. Yeah. But a half-truth, a truth twisted. You may remember an account in the Bible of a general named Naaman. Remember Naaman? The Assyrian general, the conquering hero that was a leper. And there was a little maid that he had conquered her family, and took her, part of human trafficking, and made her his servant in his house. And she had a compassionate heart toward them and didn't want to see anybody suffer. And she says, I would that my Lord were with the prophet that is in Israel, for he would recover him of his leprosy. That message got to the king of Syria. The king of Syria wrote a letter to the king of Israel and said this, I, in, in a nutshell, he said, I, I sent my, my general to you, Naaman, so that you could fix his problem. The little girl didn't say the king. She said the prophet. And then when the king of Israel got that message, he went and blitz. He went on blitz. And everybody, the whole nation got all wound up. Why? Because he says, what am I, God, to fix? I can't fix that. But you see, a half-truth Show, so stirred up a nation that it got it completely in a state of chaos until the preacher heard of it and then he said, hey, send him over here, I got this thing. But it just wasn't the way the world thought it should work. Like, we're not going to go to a preacher to find out how to fix our nation's ills. We need to go to the president. Wrong. Wrong. That's just wrong. Here's the answer. And we know that. So here's where they go. But one nation says, no, you got to go to the political authority to find out how to fix your nation. No, no, no. You need to go back to God's word to fix our nation. And then Naaman brings that same philosophy. He comes to the preacher's house. But who comes out to greet him? The servant. It wasn't Elisha. It was the servant. And he got ticked off about that. Naaman did. Well, I thought certainly he'd at least come out and see me. I mean, I'm not dealing with a second-rate guy here. This is just some little servant. I want the man. Then he says, the man, said, the preacher says, go dip in Jordan. He said, Jordan? Are not Abana and far, far better than old muddy, nasty Jordan? Aren't the rivers of Syria? We conquered you people. And you're going to tell me that I need to go to Jordan? See, the world's got a whole different skew of how things ought to be. But that doesn't change God's message. You remember, perhaps, the message was corrupt. I think of when Don Pitt, our recently graduated brother, and I were so winning in our neighborhood. I went to my neighbor and we got talking to him and my neighbor says to Don, oh, no, 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 I know what you guys want to talk about. He says, Pastor already told me I was going to hell. I've never said that. I have no idea who's going to hell and who's not. But what I did was gave him the requirements to go to heaven. Then he took them and formulated his own opinion and then he threw it back on me that I was the one that told him he was going to hell. I didn't say that. He told me that when he died on the beach in Honolulu, Hawaii, because of a rogue wave, slapped him down, broke his neck, he died, that everything was black. And I was heading to these big pillars that were black. And I was going into blackness. And all I said was, you know, 
friend, the Bible says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And he took that as I'm telling him he's going to hell. I'm just telling him that God is light. You figure out the other side of it. When you seek to share the light of the glorious gospel, do not be discouraged when it's corrupted and turned on you. Stand your ground and do not compromise your calling. Do not compromise your calling. Look at verse 12. That's one thing. That's the second thing, and then we're going to the house because we're having meatball subs today. Whoop! Not we No, not collectively we. I'm thinking of a more limited me is what I'm thinking of. I saw, I heard the energy build up right then. Oh, great, man. Yeah, no, no. Verse number 12. No, it does sound good, though, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. All right. Verse number 12. Also Amaziah said to Amos, so the wicked, well-trained, nationally known preacher says to Amos, the farm boy, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, prophesy there. But prophesy, verse 13, not again any more at Bethel, for it's the king's chapel, it's the king's court. What are they wanting to do? They want to silence the voice. They want to silence the voice. Something else you can expect is to have them take every measure to silence you. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, they will take every step to silence you. We have to be willing to stand up and let be counted anyway. Find different ways to make sure the message gets out. Interesting, when Antifa and Black Lives Matter were planning their, scheming their protests, Facebook was fine with it, Twitter was fine with it, YouTube's fine with it. But when a conservative, God-based message is coming forward, they got to silence that. It's nothing new, class. This is not new. You see it right here in the book of Amos. During the incipient stages of the New Testament church, God put his message in the heart of some men. These were not impressive people. They were observed to be ignorant and unlearned. You would need meet a little bit of them in a, in a, in a ship. When, they, when Jesus, the resurrected Lord, standing on the shore says, have you any meat? And, of course, the response was one word. No. These are professional fishermen. Why weren't they catching? As I think I hear Brother Hunter in my head right now. Why was there no meat in the boat? Well, look who was in the boat. Criticizing, gainsaying, and. Loud mouth and all those guys that were in that boat. It's an awesome message. But these guys were ignorant and unlearned. They began to go out and witness for the Lord. Their witness was empowered by the Holy Spirit and therefore it impacted thousands, literally thousands. Both the political and the religious communities could not withstand the spirit by which these men were witnessing. Therefore, The political and religious establishments took drastic action against them. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. We won't come back to Amos 7 for the remainder of this message. I'm talking about silencing the messenger. Verse 1, Acts chapter 4. As they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. So these guys are preaching. These ignorant and unlearned guys are preaching. Verse number two, being grieved, the culture was, political, religious culture, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead, and they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Look at verse 16 saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Verse 17, But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak hence no more in this 
man's name. Again, I remind you that it's not some new strategy to silence the opposing view. You can expect this as our culture turns ever more violently against God. You'll see it happen to the apostles in chapter 5 and verse 18 of Acts. They laid their hands on the apostles and put them in common prison. Verse number, chapter 8 and verse 3. For Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, halting or hailing men and women, committed them to prison. It happened to Peter and John. Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John with the sword, and because he saw it please the Jews, the religious leadership, he proceeded further to take Peter. What happened to Paul and Silas? And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison. It's nothing new. But listen, we've led such a shallow, timid, and soft existence as Americans we're not, we're not into all this fighting stuff. We're not into taking, if it's really going to cost me something, yeah, maybe there's an easier way. Why can't we all just get along? Because two can't walk together except they be agreed. Right? So we need to be preparing our spirit that we have to stand when it's not popular to stand. For the majority of our culture, for the majority of our lives, I'm 59 years old, that it's always been looked about with, with dignity and admiration if you were a solid, faithful Christian. That's changing. That's changing. Now they ridicule you, scorn you, and try to silence you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? We've got to be prepared for that. They will twist your message to use it against you, and when they can't win the argument, they will try to silence you. I silence you. You remember the experience of Joseph at the hands of his brothers, Jeremiah at the hands of the king, Elijah in his confrontation with Jezebel, Paul in the temple, arrested in the temple for preaching, Silas also again cast into prison. When modern day virtue signalers, signal, signalers such as Antifa and BLM cannot win an argument, they seek to silence the messenger by intimidation. Our country was birthed upon the battlefield of ideas. We have always had a free market of ideas and a free market economy. If your idea has substance and the marketplace desires it, then you win. If your idea cannot win the argument fairly and honestly, then you need to walk off accepting the result. But that's not what the other side does. They're going to silence you somehow. They're going to silence you. It's nothing new. Read Tortured for Christ. It's nothing new. Read Bonhoeffer. It's nothing new. You can look at Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's nothing new. Now, I'm not here to paint a gloomy story. I'm here to prepare an army. When we first went into military... What wonderful memories of that morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning, when I arrived at San Antonio, Texas. And we're standing underneath all these buildings. We're up on big pillars. And we're standing underneath there. And they got these little painted feet on the floor. And you're supposed to put your feet in them. And so you put your feet in them. And when you hear this guy coming down the road, here he comes. Make sure with your camera. Here we go. So we got this guy coming down the road. And we hear this. Click, click, click. Click, 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 click. We're like, what is that noise? And around the corner came this short little guy that somebody had spit in his Wheaties that morning. Click, he had taps on his shoes. Click, click, click. Comes out in the forehead, in the bright forehead. Pick him up! Like, what? Pick him up! We're like, our suitcases. We pick him up. We're like, look at Mercedes. Put him down! Pick him up! <laughs> what do you want? Just tell me. Tell me what you want. <laughs> put him down! We played pick him up, put him down for an hour. You know what he's doing? He's breaking us down. Then they take you to get your haircut. How would you like your haircut? If you could take a little bit off the back. He says, that'd be good. Let me get to the back. <laughs> breaking us down. 
preparing us to take orders. Preparing us if we were to get into combat. Preparing. And see, it's a battlefield, brother. What was that? Uh, who was that? Lester Olaf? It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation game room. It's a fight and not a game. So run if you want to, run if you will. But I came here to stay. There's a whole bunch of verses to that song. But we're in a battle, and that's what I want to prepare you for. Our young people that are in public school being indoctrinated with ungodly, wicked, and demonic information. They need to be alerted to that. Girls, help! Right here. Everybody here. Right here. But see, they're going to put you in school and they're going to teach you a bunch of stuff that ain't true. And then you have to be alert enough to talk to Brother Luke or Brother Jason or somebody and say, they're telling me this. Is this true? See, our nation was not founded on slavery. It's called the 1619 Project. Thousands of schools around our country are being trained. They're indoctrinating kids like you with impressionable minds that this is a wicked, ungodly country that started with the slavery in 1619. That's a lie. It's not, and it was written by some girl in the New York Times that didn't even know anything about history. So you have to be given true history so you know what the truth is. So when your teacher tries to feed you that line, you can say, wait a minute. You sure that's right? You sure that's right? Because the first slaves were not in America. They were in Africa. And Africans were enslaving their own people. That's the slave owners were black. And then read your history. That's why we're doing Wednesday nights on Real History. We have to be prepared. Truth, truth cannot be rebutted, so they'll try to silence it. So we can't do that. Amos, you're going to find out tonight. How do we respond? I'm going to tell you tonight how we respond to that. Let's stand together. Now, Father, as I come to thee, I don't want to come arrogantly audaciously at all. I come humbly. I realize that I am a sinner and I want to thank you for forgiving my sin. I want to confess to you that I have failed you and I'm sorry for that. But Father, I need you to work in the lives of these people. I think of our young people who just, you know, it's not a big deal to them. They have no idea the danger that they are in. I think of our families. You've blessed us so richly with prosperity and with peace and with a, a compact between neighbors that we live decently in our neighborhood, treating one another fairly and kindly. That's been our generation. But Lord, I, I fear that maybe we've gotten soft. And so, Lord, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray for the peace of our nation. And yet, Lord, I want you to raise up an army of stalwart believers. Raise up men with great fortitude and courage to lead their families, to lead their children, to lead their co-workers, Father, I ask that you would give me, grant me a courage in my heart through your word, not to be obstinate or to be unkind or to be unloving, nothing like that, but to be so firmly planted in your word that having done all, as Paul said, I would stand. And Father, help that to be the case here. Lord, I know of no one spiritual condition here but my own. I know that you saved my soul all those years ago in 1984. I know that. It was evidenced by the transformation of my life. But Lord, I don't know of everyone here, and perhaps there's someone here this morning that does not know. They cannot remember. They can't go back to a time when they placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their only hope for forgiveness. Father, work in their heart. Heads are bowed and eyes closed. You're here this morning and you say, Preacher, 
I'm not sure I'm saved. Well, let me ask you this. When did you come under conviction for your sin? I'm not asking when you prayed a prayer. I'm asking when did you come under con hear it, hear it. When did you come under conviction for being guilty of sinning against God? When did you come to the point you understood you couldn't fix your problem? You got a problem that simply can't be fixed. When did that happen? Preacher, I'm not sure that's ever happened. Well, then let it be today the day. In just a moment, our pianist is going to begin. It's called an invitation time. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed so you can deal with God one-on-one. -on -one. If you are uncertain about your salvation, I want you to step out and to come down to the pulpit. I'll have a man with a man, a woman with a woman, and we will take the Word of God and show you what the Bible has to say about how to be saved. The decision is yours, but we would give you the information for you to make an informed decision. Christian, perhaps you're here and you fear that you've got just a little soft. Even preaching like this was rubbing you the wrong way. It was making you nervous and unsettled. Talk to the Lord about it. Ask Him to make you strong, to make you a soldier of the cross. Give you the courage to stand. If you're here this morning, you're looking for a church home, and you believe Lighthouse is where God would have you to put your membership, in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come. You're here looking for baptism, and you've been saved, but you've never been scripturally baptized. You want to do that. As our pianist begins to play, I invite you to come. Christians, what about it? Is it time to fall on your knees before the Lord, asking for courage, for wisdom? When we stand, we have to stand with knowledge. What about it? Have you grown soft? Does confrontation intimidate you? There's a time. What about praying with your teenage boys, men? Saying, God, help us to be courageous, to be strong, to be willing to stand in the gap. Of our Christian ladies being willing to be counted like a Ruth, like an Esther, like a Hannah. What about it? Baptism, church membership, just need to deal with the Lord. I invite you to come.
Father, thank you so much for our service this morning. And uh, Father, I ask that you would continue to work in our hearts. Thank you so much for these truths that we've heard and have been challenged by. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated uh, while they're getting ready for the baptism. Does anybody remember the name of the hymn, uh, They Call Me Old Fashioned Because I Believe? I thought it, is that what it's called? I can't find it in here. Um, uh, maybe it's in the blue one. <clears throat> Let me check the blue one real quick here. Oh, the pages are ripped out of this one. <laughs> In the blue. Thank you. 453. That's it. Thank you very much. All right, your blue hymnal, 453. My sin was old-fashioned, my guilt was old-fashioned, God's love was old-fashioned, I know. And the way I was saved was the old-fashioned way, through the blood that makes whiter than snow. Old-fashioned because I believe and accept only what has been spoken from him old-fashioned because at the cross i was saved at the cross had my sins forgiven my sin was old-fashioned my guilt was old-fashioned god's love was old-fashioned i know I was saved was the old-fashioned way through the blood that makes whiter than snow. All right, give me your name. Carla, have you trusted the Lord as your Savior? Do you swear to be baptized in the name of Jesus? Yes. Turn and confess your faith, my dear sister. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. of that baptism also she's going to go down she's going to get Paisley out here but Ron go ahead and stand up with your kids there Luke you may have to hold little Zach no no you go ahead and go down and get changed honey. You're fine. all right Ron let me ask you a question have you received the Lord as your Savior by grace through faith have you been baptized since you've been saved and do you and your wife and children desire membership in the good standing in Lighthouse Baptist Church all right all right, amen, absolutely. Yeah. All right. All voting members of Lighthouse Baptist Church in favor of receiving Ron and Carla Price and children in the membership in good standing, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed likes aye. Right here. And there's aye. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sis, I need you to stand up there, huh? Give me your name again. Terry. Terry, have you trusted the Lord by grace through faith? Have you been baptized since you've been saved? And do you desire membership at Lighthouse Baptist? All right. Give me your last name again, Terry. P-O-L-K. All right. Sister Terry Polk. All in favor of receiving Sister Terry Polk in the membership in good standing, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, likes aye. All right. We got that. Why don't you sit right with them, Paul? You got. You come right up here, Terry. I'm going to have you sit, stand up here. On the way out of the church, by way of the front, Sister Carla's back there getting dried off right now. And so Jackson's going to stand in her place right now. Amen. All right, we've done as the Lord's commanded, yet there's still room. 
where's my assistant going? Well, there he is right there. All right, uh, tonight, 6 o'clock, we'll start out. We'll find out how we're supposed to respond to the challenges we gave this morning. All right, go ahead. All right, let's all stand together. Father, thank you for what you've done in our hearts this morning. I see you bring us all back safely tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>